Example 139. Below is a table of FCAT SSS developmental scores for a group of students who are struggling with math in the third grade. So this data basically involves sets of test results for students who were given some test prep. Um, first they were taking the test without any prep, right? And then they have some test prep given to them and then they take the test again to see how they score. So it's before and after results. And the thing in the middle between the before and after, the intervention here is a test prep procedure. Okay, so let's look at the structure of the data here. It's important that we do that because we have to know how to compare these two groups. Like for example, this kind of is like one sample and this is sort of like another sample. Could we just handle this by doing the independent t-test? Well the answer is no because the independence is not there. The whole idea of the independent t-test is that the two data sets are independent but in fact these two are not independent. If you look carefully you can see that um, it's the same student, right? Student one who takes the test first, then has some test prep, and then takes it again, right? So because of that, we can clearly say that the two sets of data are dependent upon one another. And what connects them is the person taking these exams, right? The one student takes the exam both before and after, and then the second student takes the exam before and after, so on and so forth. So we actually only have eight students, but 16 test results. And the 16 test results come from the fact that each student is tested twice. Okay, so since it's obvious now that it's dependent data, meaning that this column is connected to this column by the idea that it's the same student taking the test, um, then we know we should apply the dependent t-test approach. I say t-test because the sample sizes here are quite small. All right, to do that then, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a claim, right? So it says below is a table of FCAT developmental scores for a group of students who are struggling with math in the third grade. And what we want to do maybe is test the claim that there is an improvement over time due to the test prep. So if I want to say that, I need to talk about the differences then, right? So if I want to make the claim that there's some improvement due to test prep, right? And it doesn't say that here, but that's what the problem goes on later on to say. So I'm going to just start from that idea that there's some improvement due to the test prep. If I want to say that, then I'm going to have two means to look at, right? the mean before and the mean after. Let's do after here first, and I'm only doing that because I see the after column comes before the before column here, right? And then I'm going to compare that to the mean before. Now let's think about this logically. How should these two be related if I believe test prep is effective or it's helpful? Well, your average test grade should be lower before you do the te test prep then, right? And it should be higher after. So I think greater than is the proper symbol. And if we come up with that, if we make sure that that relationship makes sense to us and meets the idea that test prep will improve your score, and I think it does, right? Because before you would have a lower average, so it would be less than the after, or in other words, the after average would be higher than the before average. So if that conveys the idea that the test prep is effective, then the next step is simply to use some special notation. I'm going to move this over here by subtracting it from both sides. And if I do that, I'm going to have the mean basically after minus the mean before, right? So all I did is take this over to the other side, so that greater than symbol is still there, and I have zero. Right, so if I pick this up and move it over, I get the mean after minus the mean before is greater than zero. But this can be summarized, right? I can say that that is really no more than this. So my new claim will be as follows. The mean difference between the two is greater than zero. And that's how the claim is usually expressed in a dependent t-test or a matched paired t-test. So what we do is we just say the average difference is greater than zero here because that's what's implied by this relationship, right? As we just saw using a little algebra and using the logic of the idea that the test prep will improve your score. Okay, so now that we have the claim, our next step then is to write HO and HA. I also want to talk to you about something important here. Notice how it's after minus before, right? After minus before, after minus before. If we decide to express our claim that way, we have to be consistent when we work with our data to do after minus before. Not before minus after, not the other way around. We have to do after minus before in each one of these cases when we want to get our data later. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, so we have the claim. It has a greater than symbol that will make it the same as HA, remember, right? And the HO, of course, has to express the opposite idea. So we're going to say the average difference is less than or equal to zero. 
All right, so we have our claim, we have our HO, our HA. Now we normally take a look at the data. Well, I'm actually going to provide you the data here. The data is going to be that there are eight values here, eight values. And I say eight values because the way I'm going to get the data is to do the following. I'm going to take every value, every value that was given to us here, so every row in other words, and I'm going to subtract them. So I'm going to say 290 minus 275. That difference is 15. And notice I'm doing my subtraction after minus before. 290 minus 275 is 15. 275 minus 270 is 5. 380 minus 370 is 10, right? 260 minus 245 is 15, so on and so forth. I do that all the way down for all eight pairs, right? And I want to do that because I want to have a difference for each student, right? So student one improved his score by 15 points. Student two improved the score by 10, five points, pardon me. Student three improved her score by 10 points, so on and so forth, all the way down the line. Once I have that list, I would then calculate the average by adding them up and dividing by the number H, right? That would give me the average difference. And then from there, I would get the standard deviation of differences by applying the procedure we learned in stats one, where we would square all these values, add the two columns together, and plug those numbers into our formula for standard deviation. To do that, though, it would be time consuming, and so I'm going to assume that um, either you're comfortable doing that on your own, or the teacher will provide it to you on the exam. I would say most teachers provide these summary values to the students underneath the problem on the actual test so that they don't have to do the work themselves because it's so time consuming. All right, so now that we have those values, let's write them in. So our X bar is going to be 11.875 and our standard deviation is going to be 3.720. So there's your data. We'll use an alpha level. Let's use alpha of 5%, let's say, right? Let's use 0 0.05. Um, you could use any alpha level you want. Since I didn't have one written here in my example, I'm just going to use 0 0.05. OK, so from there, our next step is to create our test stat. Now, the test stat is nice and simple for this problem. All you have to do for the test stat is use the old t test stat we used in the past for a regular t test. So we're going to have t equals 2 x bar for the differences. So these guys should have little subscripts of differences here. There are little subscripts just saying, hey, where did this data come from? Well, it came from our column of differences that we, we calculated. And so it should be x bar for the differences minus the value that you have in HO, right? They would technically call that D sub 0, like the claimed difference. But that number is almost always zero, so we don't even have to worry about that, really. And then we'll have SD divided by the square root of ND. Now, if we plug in the numbers for this, we'll see that the mean is 11.875. We'll have to subtract zero because that's the number from HO. Then we'll divide by the standard deviation. That standard deviation is 3.720. And then divide by the square root of 8 here, which is the n. Okay, so then we'll plug those numbers into our calculator, get our test stat, and move to the next phase of the problem. So the top is just 11.875, so that's all I'm going to put there. And then I'm going to divide by parentheses 3.720 divided by the square root of 8. Close that up, hit enter, and we get the answer 9.03. So our t test stat is approximately 9.03. That is pretty extreme, and that means that there is going to be a significant difference for this procedure. All right, to finish then that idea, to make sure that this is significant, although because of its size, we're sure that it is, we'll actually draw a bell curve and use the critical value method to test the hypothesis. So using that traditional method of hypothesis testing, we need to get a critical value. If that symbol here is greater than for HA, it means we're dealing with a right-tailed test, so we should shade the tail on the right-hand side. And then we're going to put that alpha that we chose of 5%, we're going to put that all in one tail. And that means we have to now go to our table and look up our T alpha value. Now that T alpha value will basically be T.05. And the degrees of freedom is going to be 1 minus 8, which is just 7, right? just 7. So let's go to our table now. We'll look up 0 0.05 with 7 degrees of freedom, and that will tell us what our critical value is. OK, 
Okay, so we're going to be in the 0 0.05 column down to 7 degrees of freedom. So 7 degrees of freedom, that gives us the number 1.895. Okay, so we found the critical value to be 1.895, 1 1.895. 1 All right, once we have the critical value, our next step then is to draw our test data on the curve and see where it lands. And I think it's pretty clear here that this test data is gonna be way in the shaded region. And that means we will certainly be rejecting the null hypothesis in this problem. So we're gonna conclude that we should reject the null and therefore support HA. And what we're saying here then is that if we look at our claim and recognize our claim is HA, that we support the claim. And what was the claim here? The claim was that the test prep was effective at improving scores. And so you would say the sample data supports the claim. That's basically the idea, right? The sample data supports the claim. Okay, and that claim is that, again, test prep is effective at improving student scores.